Welcome back. Uh, so I'm very pleased and privileged to introduce to you Professor Fuad, who is a Syrian doctor and uh, general surgeon uh, by training, uh, and he's uh, currently undertaking research, in particular um, uh, in, uh, uh, on, on displacement around Syria and the impact on the well-being um, uh, of that displacement and the crisis in Syria. So welcome and thank you very much for presenting, uh, Dr. Fuad. As you have heard that my name is Fuad Fuad, so it's an easy name. So the, the main problem is which is first name, which is last name, but it's okay. So uh, as you know, mentioned that I'm Syrian physician, general surgeon, and public health. I moved beca because of war to Lebanon, you know, from Syria, from Aleppo, my city, and I'm working now as a, a research professor at the Faculty of Health Sciences, uh, American University of Beirut. Um, uh, good morning, good day. Um, uh, happy to um, to be in the uh, MSF Scientific Day. Um, uh, the second session will be about the long view innovation in meeting chronic health uh, needs. But why actually um, uh, chronic diseases and what about innovative waves? As you as you all know, now we are witnessing different contexts of conflict and crisis. You know, Syria crisis, and before that, Iraq war, and Kosovo, Ukraine, Libya, Yemen. So all that new crisis are characterized with main issues. You know, first it's sort of unsolved war. Second, it's sort of protracted crisis. Third, actually happened mainly in urban settlements. And all that, you know, countries, you know, have the same also um, uh, health indicators. Mainly they are middle income countries with high incidence of uh, chronic diseases. To tell one example, in Syria, for example, before crisis 2010, 16% of adults suffered from diabetes type two. 48% have hypertension. Now, during the, the last four years, um, in, in addition to 215,000 deaths because of direct violence, there's an estimate that 200,000 also died be because of chronic disease. So we are witnessing now a new model, actually, of crises that needs some sort of different approach. So our, our session now, is about you know, this innovative approach when we're looking in long-term crisis. Um, I'm happy to uh, present uh, the first session. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Beatrice Kaufman, a senior scientific collaborator in the School of uh, Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Geneva, and her presentation about a potential revolution in type one diabetes care. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. I will now present you some promising results we obtained during a collaborative studies between the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Geneva and MSF Switzerland. And this study was related to the heat stability of insulin in uh, tropical temperature conditions. The goal for MSF is to ensure a proper treatment for diabetic patients in this particular case. But a scientific question raised concerning the stability of insulin under field tropical condi uh, temperature conditions. Because mainly uh, insulin storage is recommended uh, to be in a fridge, which is not everywhere possible, and uh, a certain um, time is possible, a certain period of storage is possible at room temperature, but recommendation is below 30 degrees during the usage period of the vials once they are open. And the field ambient temperature in this particular case of the Dagahale camp in North Kenya was found to vary continuously between 25 and 37 degrees. We know that active forms of insulin are either soluble or homogeneously suspended into aqueous media. We also know that inactivation of insulin results in the formation of insoluble particles. 
insulin is particularly sensitive to freezing, and we measured a decrease in insulin concentration in the formulation after a short contact of uh, 15 minutes with a cold pack, as could occur during transportation, for instance. Insulin also needs to be protected from direct sunlight. From the literature, we found that the correlation between the liquid chromatographic quantification in the lab and the biological activity of insulin is well assessed. So that is why we will uh, use this kind of methods to conduct our study. None of the previously conducted stability studies about insulin <laughs> applied the same temperature scheme as in, is interesting us today. Either there was no temperature monitoring at all, either they put <coughs> the samples uh, under isothermal high temperatures, either they vary the temperature but more like big steps and not in continuous loops. Furthermore, there is a clear lack of data about the recent formulations of insulin, especially the pen cartridges. First of all, we needed to develop all the ana analytical tools uh, necessary to conduct the whole stability that we desired to conduct because of the lack of uh, consequent data from the literature. Uh, first of all, concerning the sample preparation, it consisted in a simple dilution of the formulations, followed by acidification prior to chroma liquid chromatographic analysis. This uh, sample preparation procedure was extensively tested, investigated, and we were not able to detect any artifact formation. Concerning the liquid chromatographic analytical conditions, I will not go deep into details, but as you can see on the diagram, uh, the selectivity of separation is excellent and no preservative present in the formulation interferes with the analysis. And a total time of analysis per one sample is less than four minutes. This analytical method was validated in terms of both linearity and reproducibility and the excellent performances uh, we obtained will allow us to interpret small variations in insulin concentration. <laughs> in a first setup of experiment, we tested five formulations of insulin. You have in green on this table <coughs> three formulations of insulin that are already used by MSF on the field, the two analog pens and the human uh, intermediate acting uh, in insulin which you may know as humulin and pH. We also included two other analogs of insulin, a, very, uh, a ultra short acting one, the Novo Rapid, and especially the long acting Lentus, uh, which may represent a potential good option for MSF to use in the future, mainly for two reasons, because it's a solution, so the homogeneity, the reproducibility of injection volume is better, and the second reason is that you only need to inject it once per day. In this first setup, we decided to reproduce in the lab exactly the um, temperature conditions that were measured on the field during the hottest period of the year. On the left, you have the diagram of the data uh, provided directly from Dagahale. <coughs> And we were able to reproduce those conditions in terms of frequency and amplitude and also the uh, minimal and maximal temperatures. Let's come to the results. <coughs> Three independent series of each formulations were submitted to this temperature cycling and were found, found to be perfectly stable over four weeks of this treatment. All the insulin concentration in all the investigated formulations remained in the 100% range. Uh, an acceptable range uh, from the pharmacopoeia indicates uh, 100 more or less 10% of target, which is acceptable in terms of both activity and toxicity. 
We were curious and went up to 12 weeks of temperature cycling phenomenon, and all the formulations remained perfectly stable. In, other, in another setup of experiment, we put our five formulations at a temperature of 31 degrees, but in continuous. This is exactly the median temperature between our two extreme temperatures. And what we found is that all insulin formulations started to degrade after four weeks of isothermal exposure to 31 degrees. And all of them were out of range after eight weeks of this treatment. So it seems that a continuous exposure to a temperature above 31 degrees is bad for insulin stability, whereas temperature cycling seems not. So we decided to increase the temperature range um, that we apply to our samples and to work from 17 to 45 degrees, which are uh, tem extreme temperatures compatible with tropical settings in a more desertic uh, region, for instance. In this second step, besides our five formulations, we were able also to add the two other human insulin that are already used by MSF on the field, uh, the regular and the biphasic, so the humulin R and humulin profile 30. And we found that after four weeks of this thermocycling treatment, all of the tested formulations remained stable. If we have a quick look at the samples after four weeks of this treatment in comparison to the references that were stored at, in the fridge, we could not see any visible alterations. Whereas if we submit the same samples to very harsh conditions, then we may be able to see some differences with the milky appearance for solutions or even crystals formations. But this does not mean that if you see, any, if you see nothing, 100% of activity is guaranteed. So as a conclusion, we were able to determine that insulin formulations, analogs and human ones, are stable for four week period uh, at temperatures up to 45 degrees, as long as the exposure to a temperature above 31 remains <coughs> limited. And it means that as long as we keep insulin in the shade and let it uh, a chance to cool down at, nine, uh, at night bef um, below 30 degrees, then it can be stored at ambient temperature in settings with maximum temperature not exceeding 45 degrees. Uh, as a general rule, a visual inspection of the formulations remains crucial. And when you see any degradation, then you must throw the formulations away. And of course, analyzing real samples coming back directly from the field would allow us validate all the study. I would like to thank the whole team of MSF in Geneva and my colleagues from the University of Geneva, David Beran from the Division of Tropical and Humanitarian Medicine and my supervisor, the professor Leonardo Scapozza, and you all for your kind attention. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, this is a great example about how you know technology can serve the idea of you know different approach, different policy in terms of you know, NCDs in, in, a, in a, a crucial and difficult uh, settings. I will open the uh, floor for one or two technical questions. So please raise your hand, introduce yourself and um, your organization. Um, so please. Good morning, Tanker at MSF Germany. I mean, listen to what you said. Thank you so much. Um, basically, we have to say um, the the sort of strict cooling paradigm for for insulin we can at least question now. Is that correct? I mean, if 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 it comes, eh? if we have to save lives uh, in, in diabetes case, your your study just shows that 
Yes, of course. Ideally, we can we have to cool them, but it's also possible for at least a month to use the insulin. Yes, it, it's, it would be possible for the patients to use the insulin at ambient temperature during one month, which is already possible in uh, everywhere on the, um, in the world. I mean, in Switzerland or in, in France or in England, it is tolerated that the patient keeps the opened vial for four weeks at room temperature during its usage period. And he, he has to discard the rest of the insulin still present in the vial after this period. But the maximal temperature recommended by the manufacturers in those conditions was 30 degrees. So we were wondering if our tropical temperature conditions in this particular case would also allow a good stability of insulin. So we can affirm, we can say yes, during four weeks at ambient temperature varying continuously, but staying half of the time below 30 degrees, then yes, it is stable. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yes, uh, good morning, Kieran, Joe Bamputcher from MSF UK. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Beatrice. It's just a quick clarification. Um, I noticed in the title, you the, the original question was about type one diabetes, but uh, obviously I think this applies equally to, uh, to type 2 diabetes. The majority of the patients in, for example, the Syrian uh, setting are going to be type 2 pa patients who are using uh, insulin. So of course, this th has very important implications for them. So I just, I, unless I, I misunderstand, maybe you could just clarify that. Uh, I, I just wanted to speak about the, the patient, the diabetic patients who need insulin injections. Either they are type 1 or yeah, type, type 2. <laughs> but uh, as I know, type 2 diabetic patients um, often take anti-diabetic uh, pills but more than sometimes insulin, they but sometimes they, they also need insulin, yes. Um, another question? Okay, thank you very much, Beatrice. That, um, <laughs>